Allora, uh, ciao a tutti, uh, benvenuti a questa session. Sorry, did we not say that this is going to be in Italian? No? Okay. I mean, that, I probably got all that wrong. Um, and apologies to real Italian speakers. Um, so, uh, very warm welcome to this session. Um, if you're even a fraction as exhausted as I am by this wonderful festival, thank you for uh, making the effort to come and take part. Uh, my name's Charlie Beckett. Uh, I'm a former journalist. I'm a professor at the London School of Economics. I run a think tank there called Polis. And um, the big thing that we've been working on for the last three years is journalism and artificial intelligence. We did a big survey back in 2018-19, which looked at what people were doing around the world uh, with AI tech and uh, what they thought about it, you know, what they thought the potential, but also the risks uh, involved were. And based on that report, we created a whole series of uh, activities and resources. So if you go to our website, you will find uh, loads of uh, case studies, for example. You'll find uh, online training courses, and you'll find reports generated from our uh, collab uh, process, where people from different newsrooms worked collaboratively together looking at uh, particular AI um, systems and tools and thinking about how AI could in improve uh, their journalism. And we also uh, run a, uh, an academy, an AI academy for small newsrooms, um, again, uh, very uh, internationally. The three speakers today have all been involved in some way uh, with this project, so I'd like to think of them not just as incredibly talented uh, editorial executives, but friends as well, who have been very supportive to this uh, whole process that we've been doing. Um, I'm not going to go too much into what is AI. We're using the term quite broadly as a kind of umbrella uh, term to mean things like automation and machine learning. Uh, the idea is it's all driven by, uh, alg algorithmically driven by software, uh, it's uh, based on data and training data. And the idea is that it does things uh, that humans perhaps used to do. Uh, and we're going to find out from our, our panelists what they do. Um, I'm going to get them to sort of introduce themselves. But, um, they are wonderful remotely, uh, at least technologically remotely. We've got uh, Nidal Sala Eldin, who um, currently works as starting a new project, actually, at actual... Springer, the German publishers, uh, creating a kind of um, kind of mini research R and D sector uh, for them. Uh, we've also got on my right, we've got uh, Lisa Gibbs, who works at uh, AP. Uh, she does their partnerships and does a lot of work uh, around tech in general and uh, AI. And on my left, we've got Gina Chua, who used to be. Uh, oh, sorry, still currently. Six more, six more wonderful days with Reuters, and then goes on to uh, work with um, what we used to call the Smiths, um, but is now and has the, the the name Semaphore, a new project. So three wonderful people. I'm going to start uh, calling in. It's like uh, the Eurovision Song Contest. Germany, please come in. I'm going to start with uh, Nidal, who's going to talk about you know what she does and uh, what works for her in relation to AI and journalism. So, Nidal, warm welcome, over to you. Hi, Charlie, hi, everybody. Douze points, I will get us started <laughs> with that. <laughs> Thank you for that intro. So, my name is Nidal, I am the Managing Director for Axel Springer's Free Tech, which is the Academy of Journalism and Technology. And what do we do there? We are building a think and do tank for the future of journalism, including journalism education and tech, a new tech program we've launched, upskilling programs for newsrooms and beyond, and also working on exciting projects with tech companies. So this is what we do at Free Tech. Why am I here? My mission is to future-proof journalism. So this is what I have in common with this new project we're building out. So um, I'm excited to talk what all of these things have to do with talent 
with training and with culture, something that is traditionally a bit underemphasized when we talk about great big technologies. So looking forward to our discussion. Great, thanks Nadal. And we'll come back and get you to talk about the actual um, you know, projects that you've been working on. Lisa. Hi there. So my title is Director of News Partnerships at the Associated Press, which sounds like it has nothing to do with AI. Um, a couple of things I'll mention. I started at AP in 2014 as their global business news editor and launched our first large-scale text automation project for corporate earnings stories. And that was really the beginning not only of um, you know, my own understanding of the power of that technology, but AP's own um, investment in developing an AI strategy. Now, in my role, primarily I'm overseeing, you know, how AP might partner with universities and tech startups, for example, um, and um, if any of you went to a, one of Charlie's previous sessions, um, one of our grants right now is around um, helping local and smaller newsrooms in the U.S understand AI technologies better and figure out how to use them um, in, in their own newsroom. So those are the things I'm working on now. And what, tell us a little bit about what AP actually does with these techs. Um, so in addition to lots of text automation to produce you know, a high volume of content, which as an agency that is part of the mission of what we do, um, we're using things like event detection tools to identify breaking news events um, more quickly, um, automated transcription. Um, we also built a tool that combines um, computer visioning with uh, text summarization to be able to um, automatically caption video um, and create automated shot lists uh, and transcripts from the massive amounts of video that are coming in through AP's Global Video Hub in London primarily. Um, so th those are some examples of specific tools that AP is using that are AI driven. But, you know, I mean, just to kick off a little um, thought bubble for later in the conversation, um, using tools that happen to be AI powered is not the same thing as having an AI powered newsroom or an AI strategy. So that will be my little um, thought bubble for later. Yeah, and we'll definitely come to the, the whole sort of management and strategy question um, in, a, in a little while. Gina. What were you doing at Reuters? No, no, still six still glorious days. So first of all, I just want to say I got, came to the wrong panel. I thought this was the panel fatigue panel, uh, <coughs> but, uh, but, but apparently not. Um, so uh, my name is Gina Chua. I'm executive editor at Reuters for six more days. Um, what that means is I have to do all the bits that nobody else wants to do, uh, which is fine. Uh, and part of that was uh, driving tech development uh, in, in the newsroom. Um, you know, and that covers a, a, a multitude of sins, right? Uh, as, as with Lisa and the AP, we do speed automations. We, work, we have to work at sort of millisecond uh, rates because we do uh, a lot of financial stuff. There's, there's obviously um, some just straightforward um, automated stories. There's all those other things that uh, Lisa talks about, transcription and so on. Um, but I guess the thing that I've really been focused on um, in my time there has been looking at sort of industrial scale of, uh, of uh, whether you call it AI or, or, um, or uh, just technology and or automation. And, and I just want to reference something that, that, that Charlie said, which is, you know, to do things that humans used to do, that's not what we're trying to do. I don't want to do that. I mean, yes, I do want to do that, and that brings efficiency, but there, but there are multiple reasons to, to to bring technology into the newsroom. One is efficiency, but what I've really been uh, focused on trying to build is the cybernetic newsroom, which is where you take technology to do things that humans can't do, um, or in fact, humans can't do at scale, or humans can't do particularly well, and marry that with what humans can do. Um, and so the best example is, uh, is a piece of soft, uh, well, is a, is a tool system that we built called Insight, um, I wanted to call it Cylon, but for those of you who have ever watched the new Battlestar Galactica, you realize that's about humans creating a machine that rebel and kill everybody. <laughs> so 
not a good name. Um, <clears throat> but um, you know what that does, it, it looks at data, financial data and sports data in our case, because um, that's the data we have access to, but we could theoretically take any data. In fact, it also takes COVID data. Um, trolls it, looks for patterns, generates not stories, or they can do that, generates sentences, flags them to reporters, um, who then can do kind of what they want with it, which is they can dismiss it, and we can talk a little bit about that, um, or they can say, ooh, interesting, let me follow up, or they can just use it and plug it into their stories. And, and the goal there is, is marrying what computers do well with what humans do well and get you know, a, a some improvement on the practice of journalism. And how would you sort of characterize the, the benefits? You sort of hinted at it that, I mean, is this about efficiency or is it about creating different uh, products or, or content? What's the, what's it, the, the gain it, it's for a, you? It's a, bit of, it's a bit of everything, right? I mean, I think, um, so part of it is, is, is the idea that um, you can gain efficiency, right? If you want to know, you know, uh, if, if you, if you want to write the sentence that says, you know, uh, Microsoft, a company headquartered and whatever, we actually have that all in a database, right? So you can just pull that and it comes up and you've just saved yourself typing. So that's a certain amount of efficiency. There's other efficiencies to say, um, you know, Microsoft closed up X um, and, um, uh, you know, and have that automatically filled in. But the, the, the two real values here. One, one value is this idea that you as a reporter can't find everything. You don't have, not only do you not have time, you don't sometimes know what to look at. And, and for those of you who are business reporters, the one thing that I wanted to build, I have not managed to do that, um, is the idea that if you look at insiders, you know, company officials and the stock that they sell, in the company, that's a signal, right? If too many insiders are selling stock, well, maybe you should look at that company. Well, it's a pain in the ass to go track all the insiders at all the companies you, you cover and see what they've done, say, over a two or three week period. A machine can do that for you. And if it does that, that gives you new insight. The other thing you can do once you have these systems, and again, we haven't built this, and I would love to build this, is it's a classic trope, which is, you know, you look, think of market reports, right? And, and, they, and they typically go, the market is closed. Uh, the, uh, it, the market closed up 2% today. Um, not difficult if you have these tools to be able to say for a personalized story that market closed up 2%, your portfolio closed down 3%. Why wait till the market closes? If you've got this equipment and you can generate stuff, you can have the, the users press a button and they can say it's 345, the market's currently up 2%, your stock's currently down 3%. But why stop there? If you could do all of that, and it's not technically that difficult, you could do perturbation analysis slash counterfactuals, and you would say it's 345, the market's currently up 2%, your stock is down 3%, and if you hadn't sold Microsoft last week, you idiot, you would be up 4%. That's a new product. That's, that's not that's just a product from a business point of view. That is service to readers. And, and what I really am and engaged in is the notion that we need to rethink the product and really take advantage of what we have. And, and I want us to move away from the notion that machines will help us do what we do. I want us to think about what machines can enable us to do. That's absolutely fascinating. Nadal, I want to come back to you because I mean, Gina's talking there, obviously, about the technology and what it can do, but she also uh, talked about how that tech relates to the people in the newsroom. I just wondered if you could talk to us about the work you've been doing um, uh, over the last few years, working on kind of skills and culture uh, in the newsroom related to uh, AI technologies. Yes, so um, before... Uh, coming back to Axel Springer, I was working at the German press agency, DPA. Uh, Lisa, we know each other uh, from our work there. And I was responsible for product and innovation there. And of course, at an agency, you, you always have to think in terms of scale. What can an agency offer that maybe the smaller newsrooms can't by themselves? So uh, that really, really resonated with me. And you know what you just uh, described about thinking at scale and also maybe adding to that or building on that, 
machines do what they do best and help us do the work that people are traditionally not good at, right? So analyzing giant amounts of data and looking for patterns and scouring for, for patterns, that's a really, really hard job to do. So I think um, we have to move away, and I think all of us agree on that, uh, for all these, this binary approach, technology is good and uh, or bad, and journalism is good or bad. I would like to um, celebrate a new culture where we embrace technology as a part of journalism. It's not a choice anymore to say, I don't like technology as a journalist. So uh, my approach is a deeply, deeply integrated approach to technology when it comes to research, production, and discovery. So this is, has been basically the red, um, in Germany we say der rote Faden, so what connects all my different work experiences, be it in this uh, as a social media editor or working at Innovation for Welt and then moving over to the DPA and build, using all of these experiences to build what we're uh, doing now at the Academy of Journalism and Technology. What else do we need for that? Um, apart from technology and journalism going hand in hand, I think we also have to consider the life cycle, right? Or the employee life cycle, the talent life cycle. What all of us are struggling with at times we have um, new technologies, we have emerging platforms, we have new products we want to build. And at the same time, the culture for that has never been really established. So what happens is you have um, fantastic reporters and editors, fantastic journalists who tell amazing stories who have never been socialized with techies. So there's always this misunderstanding and like, you know, things get lost in translation. Oh, there's a tech department. What do they do? Do they install the printer or what do these guys do? Like, why, why do we need them, right? And moving away from all of this, we are looking at the very early talent funnel, if you will. My goal and our goal is to make collaboration between journalists and techies so seamless and so organic that, that people learn that very early on in their journalism training. They get together with techies. We've implemented this every Friday now. Um, the people are working together on, on projects. Yesterday, we had Hank von S. I believe some of you know him, work with our uh, journalism and our tech students. And they talked about the potentials of AI in the journalism context. And that's a totally different conversation because these people learn to work with each other at the beginning of their careers. So they don't have that problem when they are in the newsroom. They've been working there for 25 years and they don't, not all of them, but some of them, it's hard for them to understand why we need technology. And my approach is technology empowers journalism. And I really, really hope that we get this culture in all of the newsrooms around the globe. Thanks, thanks, Nidal. Lisa, uh, as uh, Nidal was saying so eloquently there, this uh, raises kind of different expectations around the way that people work. Um, so management is, is critical, isn't it? I mean, you know that, and we've, that's been emphasized, especially in this period with the pandemic, that how people work is, is, is so important. Um, what has had to change uh, in terms of the way that you kind of organize a newsroom and the kind of roles and so on that people uh, uh, ha have in this kind of new, sort of hybrid, uh, technologically informed uh, news production? So I think there's a few elements to this. One is, um, and when talking to people in my newsroom and in other newsrooms about AI, I remind them that technology has been informing and changing how journalists do their work since the beginning of journalism. You know, this is not suddenly some new phenomenon that has just pop down with robots um, from the movies, we can point to many examples of really transformative technologies. So that's number one. Um, it is also not a new phenomenon that it can be difficult to affect change in a news organization. Um, workflow changes, especially as resources decline, these things are never easy. Um, getting more directly to your question about the kinds of jobs that didn't exist um, 10 years ago, um, certainly, you know, I mean, we hired our first automation editor in, I want to say, 2015, um, but 
you know, certainly the job of data management. You know, suddenly an editor on my staff became responsible for um, overseeing the master database of company information or whatever the structured data is that has to be, that is going to be automated. Suddenly that was part of the job. So while journalists and editors were freed from the routine work of writing the same earnings story over and over again, there were other tasks and responsibilities that came along with it. Um, also, I think one of the reasons that um, when, when our projects have been successful, and generally they have been, um, it's very important to have the entire staff involved in reacting to, commenting on, um, developing the project, and to have lots of quality control testing. Um, that actually is a bit of a change from the typical culture of a newsroom. You know, testing and iterating and sending mistakes to you know the group for let's try it again. Like that kind of process and thinking, um, you know, was not native. So there are lots of things like that that um, have to be navigated when trying to introduce you know, new technologies or ways of do it, doing anything regardless of whether it's AI or, AI or not. And there have been often new tools that we've introduced in the newsroom where we never even use the word AI. You know, this is a problem that we need to solve in our newsroom and this tool is gonna help us do it. And at the end of the day, that's what you know, the use of this technology um, like, that's what it's for. Um, you know, we're going to save you time, we're going to break news faster, we're going to um, get better quality information to help you cover your beat. You know, whatever the goal is, that's really what it's about, and not whether it's NLP or NLG or machine learning or deep, you know, it, that is, you know, that, that's for some people to understand, but not everyone has to understand it. That's, that's a really important, in, in, interesting point, isn't it, Gina? How much do, uh, how serious is this as a challenge to sort of newsroom cultures and so on? How much do people, in your experience, need to think differently or be super informed about, about this to keep doing their work? Why do you think I'm leaving? No. <laughs> uh, uh, no, look, a couple, couple, of, couple of quick points, right? One is, one is and, and it's just to echo Lisa's point, which is a really important one for people in newsrooms, especially people making um, financial decisions, resource decisions. Tech is not cheap. You don't necessarily save money. The goal has to be, yeah, okay, you, you, you can save money, that's great, um, but the goal really needs to be better, not not necessarily cheaper. And it's not cheap because you need support, you need QA, you need roadmaps, you need to keep running the damn thing. And a lot of newsrooms don't think this way, even the best data teams don't, because the best data teams build stuff, let it die, right? So that's the first thing. It's like broadly, you have to really think of this as investment. The other issue, and, and, and this is a really key, critical uh, question for newsrooms, and I haven't solved it by a long shot, why do you think I'm leaving, um, is, um, is culture and workflow. And when I think of building stuff at industrial scale, so it's not just like, hey, this team will use this, this thing, and you can do that, right? But when you say, I want the whole newsroom, I want 50% of the newsroom to use this tool, in a way that significantly disrupts how they do things, um, it's very, it's, it's challenging especially when you have you know, a 23, 2400 person newsroom. And so one of the big challenges I've had in thinking about design is do you design tools that fit into people's existing workflows because it drives adoption, right? And, and I can tell you that our CMS, which had been worked on for decades without much success, finally was successful because they mimicked the 30-year-old CMS that we have, which is terrible for all sorts of reasons because the underlying architecture, <coughs> you know, we've now spent the last 10 years rebuilding the underlying architecture underneath that. Or do you make tools that force you to do things a certain way, tell them, I'm sorry, this is a, you don't have any choice from that, you used to use this, now you're using this, there you go. Um, I'm increasingly leaning towards the second, but I recognize what a challenge that is. And I think that the, the third final thing I'll say about this is that, that Lisa's absolutely right. Um, 
about the idea that, that you have to sort of inculcate people into this. And really, um, I've, I've now come to use this term quite a lot, which is code switching. Right. You need people to understand code switching. You have to have people understand, at least the key people in your organization, right? And if you're in editorial, then, then, then the newsroom needs to learn that skill and not expect other people to say, you need to learn to talk tech. You need to learn to talk product. You need to learn to talk UX. You need to learn to talk, um, you know, sales and business, if you want to create a new product, you have to speak their language and you have to invest time in doing that. But if you do that, you can actually get a lot done. Uh, Nidal, I'm going to come back to you because as, as Gina's saying there, people have to sort of think differently about uh, this technology, but also how it relates to uh, the work they do and, um, you know, the production systems and so on. You're obviously working in, 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 in the uh, academy there. What, can you tell, talk to me a little bit about uh, the, the kind of new skills um, that people need and the new potential roles and so on? Yes, uh, happy to. So um, one thought when we talk about tools, and this is um, in addition to what uh, uh, Gina just, um, just described, we always um, tend to focus on what is exactly the new technology? What kind of tool can we use? That's correct, but sometimes we have to take a step back and ask why. Why are we doing this? What are we hoping to accomplish with this? So the role of a journalist is expanding. Francesco Marconi, I think, was the one who said, it's not about journalism only anymore. Journalists are morphing into information officers. And this is an expanded view of what we're doing as journalists. It's about audience needs. It's about product thinking. It's about different story formats. It's about distribution. So it's, we're evolving. And so far, the education of journalists has not reflected that. So um, when we talk about journalism, we have to, I think, also talk about the next level, and that's iterative journalism, where we combine the best of both worlds, not only technology and journalism, but the product thinking aspect of it. And this means that we incorporate audience and learn to speak that language. It doesn't mean that everyone has to know what programming languages are being used in the company, right? But you have to have a little bit more than just a couple or few people who take on this bridge role and translate, right? We have a couple of translators, a couple of people in these bridges, and we need more of these people. And why? Because these people are going to be responsible and they're going to be creating tomorrow's innovations. So this is where we have to come from. So it's, um, this is one aspect and the second one being to be very, very pragmatic about what data and what types of AI are being used in newsroom context, right? So data is fantastic at analyzing, describing, especially when we talk about big um, amounts of data where you can, um, you, you can see certain patterns in it, then you can say, okay, uh, we analyzed it, we described it and displayed. But all of this data, it doesn't matter how many terabyte I have, it's not gonna answer the question, so what? And this is where the journalists come in. So it's not the threat anymore. All of this data, you can sit on a giant amount of data, it will not answer the question, what is the relevance of this giant amount of data? So this is just uh, maybe um, adding to this aspect. So when we talk about um, skills, our general approach is to build and train the learning muscle so we are ready for whatever comes tomorrow. Right now we're talking about AI, we're talking about the metaverse, we're talking about extended reality, but these people are going to see throughout their careers technological disruptions that we cannot anticipate today. And what we are trying to do is install this way of working together, this way of doing product thinking under the roof of the free tech and at, at tackling people at different stages in their career. So we have the Free Tech Academy. The first pillar is the journalism school where we are educating people to not only become multimedia reporters. This is what used to um, what we used to do until now as one of the leading um, J schools in Europe. But we're saying all of the roles have changed massively. So why don't we offer specialized education in the second year? So everybody gets the journalism training Everybody is ready to work as a reporter, but tomorrow or maybe next year, we're going to need somebody 
who is an absolute wizard at complex algorithms, but from the editorial side, right? We need people in the newsrooms who are able to demystify and read these algorithms. And where are they going to come from? They have to be trained somewhere. So we're moving away from the one size fits all approach. Everybody gets a journalism training, but in the second year, they get really, really specialized. And we have the second pillar, the tech program, where we're training product managers, we're training software developers, and interaction designers. And these are usually groups that rarely have to do with each other, right? But we're putting them together. And everybody stays in their expertise, but they work together on projects. So it becomes very organic and seamless for them to do stuff together. And then the third pillar. This is something that I'm very excited about. Offer training to people who are in a more advanced stage in their career. And I'm not talking about leadership training. We don't offer leadership training, but for example, highly specialized verification training to know what's happening on Telegram, what's happening on other platforms that are emerging to learn how to um, find out if an email has been doctored with cybersecurity topics, all of these things have to be offered and we can't expect every newsroom uh, every newsroom at Axel Springer to do this by themselves so we're offering the, uh, offering it as we speak uh, we have a big verification masterclass happening um, in the past couple of uh, weeks and still ongoing where people can get a real certificate and feel like they are ready to understand and that we are helping them train and understand these new platforms and the uh, the, the last topic is to have a very hands-on approach when it comes to deciding which projects are we going to work on. So in the media industry, we love the shiny, glittery projects that win us awards and that have a great award show. And then you never hear from it again, right? And we're totally moving away from that. So I'm not interested in showcases anymore. I'm interested in use cases. So we are working, we're having this young group of talent work together with the newsrooms, everyone is embedded in a unit and they have challenges together, like real life challenges that newsrooms are facing. And this is where we come in. So we're training them a totally new way of thinking and approaching their careers. And also we're becoming more diverse. That's a topic that's very important to me. 40% of our uh, journalism ta uh, talents do not have a traditional college degree, for example, right? So the, we're the leading J school in this area in Germany. And all of these small things, you see how the dots connect. It's not only about technology, it's about diversity in skills, in approaches, in backgrounds. And when we get the people together, this is where the magic happens. Nadal, that's fantastic. Really, really interesting. And it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, anyone in a J school should be looking at what you're doing and thinking about it. Lisa, um, in, the, in the newsroom, what do you say to the journalist who says, I didn't come into this industry to be an information officer, you know. <laughs> I, I'm a journalist, uh, you know. I'm going to leave that to the tech people. So, I mean, I think applying it to the specific example that I oversaw, um, I think it was about really demonstrating the case, which happened to be absolutely 100% accurate, that they would be freed up to do more journalism, what they can, you know, real journalism, by, you know, being able to contribute to the creation of the template for automated earnings reports. So, I mean, I think bottom line is it's about really being focused on the end result, you know, being intentional about freeing up time from routine tasks. Um, and I think, you know, people often ask me whether my business news staff was protesting or worried about their jobs. And actually, no, they weren't. Um, I think everybody really understood. Um, they, you know, what I often say is that they actually felt like robots sitting at their desks writing earning stories over and over again, and they were actually quite glad um, to let an automated system take that over. What they were concerned about, and there were, and these were legitimate concerns, is 
you know, about the quality of the automated story, um, which of course would never um, replicate the kind of more contextual and detailed story that a journalist could do. And, and we actually deliberately started calling them earning snapshots instead of stories after that to convey that we're not trying to pretend that this is a story on the level of what, you know, one of our knowledgeable beat reporters would write. But um, if I could, I want to jump a little bit over to some of the things that Nadal was talking about, because I do think the connection not only between technology and journalism is really critical, but, you know, and we've all sort of referenced it in different ways, there has to be product thinking as well. Um, and what can easily happen is that you end up doing a series of kind of tactical projects. Oh, great, we're going to use AI to produce this amazing visual investigation. Oh, great, we're going to use AI to automate 3,000 earnings stories. And we're sort of missing, um, you know, kind of a more strategic approach to personalization that requires an awful lot of automated uh, metadata and more sophisticated metadata or um, take, you know, being able to figure out how to leverage this technology to actually enhance products for the readers. And so I think um, w one of the things that AP did uh, a few years ago was create a working group that included people from news and technology and product and was led by our, was and is, led by our senior vice president of strategy. So what you're doing has to kind of roll up to the overall goals of the news organization and make sure that the projects you do decide to tackle, given the complexities and the costs, that are really meeting the needs of the organization, whether it's the newsroom or business sustainability or you know whatever it happens to be. Um, you know, so having that group in the room talking about you know, the choices about what should we do, I think has been a really important way of doing things, as opposed to having ownership of it reside in, say, technology alone or, you know, that sort of thing. So, I mean, I think we're all kind of expressing versions of that, but I think like that's really a multifaceted effort. I uh, just want to say that in a few minutes um, we'll be taking questions and we're going to sort of do it in the traditional fashion of you putting your hand up and speaking to me uh, and asking a question and then I'll relay it to, to everybody else. So have a little think if, if there's a question, uh, get it ready for a, a few minutes' time. Gina, I just want to um, ask you, we've talked about uh, the sort of cultural issues, I suppose, and the sort of personnel and skills and roles and, and so on, and how that can be a potential, if not barrier, it's something you have to sort. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning, you said, um, words to the effect, this is not some sort of magic dust that you pull out of a box and plug in, that they need resources and time and effort. I wonder if you could talk in that sense about, um, not necessarily what's gone wrong, but perhaps what it can't do or what is difficult about uh, trying to implement or develop these technologies? <laughs> so we're, we are slightly unusual uh, compared to most of the newsrooms in that we have a very large mm -hmm. tech uh, department. Um, and that's a blessing and it's a curse, right? Because I, mean, I think people um, who can buy stuff off the shelf, I think you, know, you don't get it exactly right, but it's done and you've got a service contract and you have an SLA and you know exactly what you're getting um, uh, for you. The, Having a tech department is great because you can actually write requirements, but then of course you have to learn how to write requirements, and that's a, that's a whole different skill set. The, the, the real issue is you have to fight for resources. You always have to fight re for resources, right? And you do that in, in, in a straight up newsroom, and you do that for technology. You want a bigger sports bureau? Well, you have to fight for that because there's only so much resources, and you're going to take it from the politics team or vice versa. And it's exactly the same thing. What there, there are so many key continuing tools that need to be built um, and need to be maintained, and if you don't um, 
if you, um, you know, if you want money to do this, then you've got to find out where it's going from. So that's really the key issue. And, and, and part of that, I think, to, to, to Lisa's point and to Nadal's point about sort of building a better strategic vision at your organization level so you can align those, those priorities, those goals, and that strategy, and the resources behind it. Ultimately, when you think about this from a really strategic point of view, I mean, this is a game of prioritization. It's a game of resources. How do you put the, the right amount of money behind the right um, amount of, um, of, of effort for the thing that you, that you believe you should achieve? And then, of course, the other part of it is, just as with all projects, and I want to pick on technology people because journalists also fail to deliver on their promises all the damn time, uh, which is like, you know, everything runs, oh, everything overruns, everything's over cost, everything comes in late. It's, you know, it's a given, right? And so you have to build that into your, in, into your planning. But it really comes down at the end of the day to, to, to having enough of a vision, being able to get consensus around it or to, to sell it. And, and again, this is why it's critical for journalists or at least newsroom leaders to speak the same language as other people and, and for everyone to understand what, what it is that we're trying to achieve. I love the AP idea of pulling that team together. We haven't done it. I will have to steal, well, I can't do it in six days, but I will try to do it in six days. <laughs> you can do anything in six days, come on. Um, Lisa, before we go to, to questions from the audience, I think one thing that indeed people might be thinking is, well, look, these three wonderful people all work for basically colossal news agencies actually you know so you're kind of big and you do have big sort of tech sections or departments but I also know that AP recently you know you did this report on looking at small newsrooms at local newsrooms in 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 America and I just wondered if you could sort of talk about how you know people working in yeah relatively smaller uh, news organizations, different news organizations might think about AI. Definitely, and for those of you who are more deeply interested in this subject, the authors of that report, Amy Reinhardt and Ernest Kung, are sitting here in the room. Um, uh, they surveyed 200-ish um, smaller local newsrooms in the U.S. of all kinds. Um, uh, to get responses and develop an AI readiness scorecard that attempted to really look at um, what is the level of knowledge about AI in smaller or local newsrooms, um, what's, uh, what are the kind of technological technological capabilities they already have, what are they interested in. And I mean, I don't think it'll surprise anyone to know that um, they're not particularly far along, um, there is a massive gap between news organizations like ours and most of the news organizations out there. Um, not having a real good awareness of what the technology is capable of doing, you know, not having the data management systems or skills or expertise to begin to take advantage of it. Um, and being, and I think almost more critically than any of those things I just said, um, not having real bandwidth either dollars or time-wise for risk. So you can only try something new if you've got the ability to be okay if it doesn't work. Um, and that, it, I mean, it's a real challenge uh, for the news industry because essentially you have, in the rest of the world, the AI-powered future is moving along quite nicely um, and our own industry is really not prepared uh, from a pure technological or tools standpoint or a talent and re you know, bandwidth standpoint. So um, those are sort of the sobering you know, conclusions of that report and I think one thing we're really thinking a lot about is what are the kinds of scalable solutions that might make it easier for a small newsroom to take advantage of some of these uh, technologies without needing to go hire their own developer or their own data scientist or their own data journalist or you know, whatever, um, whatever it is. Um, so, yeah. And, and I should just say, it, it's a fantastic report. Uh, even if you're you know, not based in, in the US, 
um, partly because, as, as Lisa says, it does paint a picture of people struggling to uh, use this uh, technology, but it, com it also has a wonderful uh, list of what you can do, even in a small newsroom. Uh, people coming up with ideas or problems that they have in the newsroom that might be addressable with this technology. So it's a fantastic report. And uh, I should also say that our organization, Journalism AI, we are doing a lot of work trying to provide uh, resources, training, um, and workshops for smaller newsrooms. So again, if you're from a smaller news organization, even if you're just a couple of you in it, um, go and have a look at the website, get in touch with us, uh, so we can kind of address this kind of inequality gap. I said I was going to take questions, so has anybody got any questions for these three wonderful people? One right there, you just... It's a really good question. You must be some sort of business studies type person or something, you know. Anyway, the question was uh, around the idea, do, do these, um, you know, development of these uh, tools and systems, do they happen um, simultaneously or do you have to do one at a time? And do they happen across different newsrooms uh, in a similar way or do individual newsrooms always have to uh, develop and adopt these uh, tools and systems uh, for themselves. I've got that right? Yeah? Fantastic. <laughs> Tell us, Gina. Uh, th thanks. Um, if, uh, <laughs> it depends. Yeah, it depends. Um, I mean, really, it depends, right? I mean, they're, 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 they're tools you can buy, they're tools that exist. Um, you know, how you use them is a little bit up to you. Um, I really don't think there's a single answer. I think it really is what you think is valuable for your newsroom. And what are you trying to, what are you trying to solve for? Are you trying to solve for product? Are you trying to solve for efficiency? Are you trying to solve for insight? You know, and, and, and I think that that's, you can hack all sorts of tools to do all sorts of things, right? Um, and I think it, it's, it's just, you know, so I mean, I'll, I'll give an example, not giving away any secrets. Um, but, you know, so for example, we have a photo service, right? Our captions are almost all in English. In fact, our captions are in English. Um, and so if you're a Japanese customer, then you have a problem because you have to know some English to be able to find the photos. Well, um, and, it's, and it's not cost effective for us to translate all our captions into Japanese just because our lovely Japanese clients can find them. But, you know, you don't need a perfect translation, so run the damn thing, you know, and, and of course they can Google Translate themselves, but build the thing into the product and all of a sudden you've got a better product and stickier, right? That's a use case of an existing technology that, you know, that you can use. You just have to think through what's your, what's your end goal that you want out of it. So it depends. Yeah, and I think this, what's gonna be interesting as well is the way that this, you know, some of this technology has been around for a long time. You know, if you think about, I don't know, search, that's algorithmically driven, you know, it's, tr it's machine learning. Uh, and we all use that in a small or, or big newsrooms. But, and I get the sense as well that more tools are going to be developed, more systems and software are being created now. There may, well, there may be more off the peg, but I think I'm right in saying, Lisa, that there's nef there's nef nothing is ever really off the peg, is it? Uh, we, um you know, there's different levels of approach to it. I mean, we talk about, you know, the buy, build, or partner question. You know, do you buy the product and figure out how to make it work even if it's not perfect? You know, do you build it in-house, which means having the staff, you know, and the resources to do that? One of the things AP started doing from the very beginning was partnering with startups 
um, for us, that provided a huge advantage in that not only did we have to invest a lot of dollar resources in the technology, many you know, startups are looking for real world use cases and, and projects where they can test their technology and, and, and build on it. Um, and so we had a lot of success with that, um, you know, with, with that method. Um, and, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it ends up going in a different direction. And to be clear, there are challenges with working with startups, um, you know, who are not your staffers and, you know, work on their own timeline. Um, so, I mean, I think there's pros and cons to every approach, but I think that partnering is an underappreciated um, strategy for technology innovation in news as well as actual journalism collaboration. Yeah, I mean, that collaboration thing has been so, such a revelation for us over the last four years, you know, discovering how uh, profitable it can be, you know, that the collaboration, as we put it, kind of breeds collaboration. Once people get used to that way of working, they can see all sorts of other opportunities to, to do it. Next question to you, sir. Well, she's part of the problem, isn't she? <laughs> you mean how do we keep journalists from going to work? Sorry, I just better repeat the question for the people who are listening online. It just the question was asking how do news organisations keep, especially I think tech people. Um, from going off to far better paid jobs uh, with the lovely people at places like Google or Meta or doing startups, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm curious what Nadal has to say about this too, um, you know, having worked in a couple of different contexts, but I mean, I would say a couple of different things. Um, I don't know that we really expect, we just plan that we're not, may not have them for very long. Um, we have done a couple of projects by working with, um, in New York, Columbia University has a dual degree program in journalist, journalism and computer science. Uh, we've been able to do a lot of interesting work with students from that program. Um, we've also hired a lot of our um, data team or you know, related uh, from outside journalism, um, people who work maybe for public policy, um, organizations that are mission driven um, and so you know relate to the mission of, of journalism and what we do I mean there this is not a good answer to like you know you're not going to prevent someone from going you know to work for Google at triple the salary or whatever scary number that is but you know you try to you try to work with what you can let, let me let me chime in quickly um, uh, you're gonna lose people right that's a given um, but I think, I mean, and, and, and look, there's certain skills that, that can walk in anywhere. Um, really good graphics people, they, they can go work anywhere right now, right? And, and, and they're never going to be at a lost job. The, the funny thing is, and I know because we all look like nerds all the time, um, is that we're actually the sexy part of any interest, any business. And it's fascinating. I tell you, I mean, we have a huge... So um, who's we? <laughs> no, I mean, who, do you mean... The newsroom. The newsroom. The, the, the newsroom, the mission, as long as we actually can sell a vision. Right. Uh, and we're not just griping all the time and we're not making fun of tech people. Um, they want to work with us. Not all of them, but, but a fair number do. I can tell you that we've got, um, you know, at Thomson Reuters, we've got this massive ISRM department, digital security department. We're the fun part. They want to do things with us. I mean, they don't always have enough money to do it and they've got to go do all these, you know, sort of more boring corporate security stuff. But we're the interesting people. We give them the really interesting use cases and challenges. And I think you can find tech people, it, they may not be the necessarily the, the best in the world because, you know, some of the best in the world get paid a lot more, but they are but they are people who are just engaged with the mission. And as long as you treat them reasonably well and you sell them the idea of what they're achieving, you know, I think I think you can keep people longer than you think you might. Yeah. They still have to pay the mortgage at the end, so they will leave you one day, <laughs> but that's different. 
And, and Nadal, I just want to bring you in on this one, and, and perhaps more yes. generally, what kind of vision um, do you s do you sell it, if you like, to the, the, the people you're going to work with in the academy? But also, I guess, what attracts them? What attracts mm -hmm. them to yeah. this kind of work? Yeah, so here's how I view it. If we break it down, what do people want? If they're techies or journalists or work in other areas, functional areas, they want to believe in what you do, they want to become something, and they want to belong. It's about believing, becoming, and belonging. And if we look at this, the media industry in journalism offers great potential. For example, people who care about independent journalism like to work for Axel Springer, for example, because we're known for independent, um, independent digital journalism. We have a great transformation story. We have a great academy that has a long history. Um, the fact that we don't discriminate when it comes to applications and uh, being a... Are you still there? I'm, because I don't see you. Yeah, we can hear you. Sure. Keep going. Oh, okay, wonderful. Um, so uh, basically, we want to invite everyone to be a part of this. So we have people, very young people who have not graduated. We have, last time we had somebody applying, who, she was above 40, and she made it to one of the final rounds, and she wanted to redefine herself and uh, go a totally different direction. So everyone who cares about purpose, I think, can make a great... Um, great living and a great career in journalism. That's the one aspect. And the other thing, people want to work on very inspiring and cool projects. They want to feel like they're impactful, that their job can make a difference. And I think this is an asset and a leverage that many media companies have not yet um, have have not yet really really used. So if it's only if it's only about uh, financial incentives. Obviously, the later you are in your career, the more senior you are, the harder it's going to be to match your salary. So that's also one of the reasons why we are looking at the early talent funnel. Get people in very early, get them excited about journalism, about the thought that tech empowers journalism, and bring them together, have them collaborate, and create really, really cool um, projects. So this is what we, we want to do, and we have uh, many applicants. The next um, the next round starts in June. So if you want to apply, <laughs> one of you guys in the audience, Excellent. I don't think so, but uh, still going to plug it here. Excellent. Listen, we're, we're running out, run out of time. And I think that's a wonderful kind of positive, dynamic way to, to end it. So vielen Dank, Nidal. Uh, and also, Sehr gerne. Uh, thank you very much also, Lisa, for all the work you've done with us. Uh, but also for your your thoughts today and gina thank you so much for being part of this and also huge huge good wishes and good luck for the new project as well it's very exciting and feel free if you want to follow up i'm here but also my two wonderful colleagues who actually speak italian better than i do unbelievable but true mattia <laughs> and sabrina are both there so Talk to those two if you want to find out more about the project. But thank you all very much for being here, and uh, enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you so much. Bye.